Thanks for coming, everyone. I'm Alexandra. You can find me as Alexandra933 on Twitter. 933 on Twitter. Um, yeah. Now, a quick note about my talk. I'm probably going to take up the entire time. It's important that I, I show you the full arc. Uh, so I'll be available for questions after. Uh, feel free to reach out to me here if you're here at Par Parallelme Polis. Um, and if you have questions on the live stream, I'll be monitoring and getting back to those after. So feel free to ask questions. Um, after. <laughs> so, um, in Canada, it's customary to acknowledge uh, the unceded Aboriginal lands we occupy. Um, since I don't know the history of the lands here in Prague, I wanted to dedicate this talk to Peter Hingens. So, uh, please take a moment if you don't know Peter. Uh, Peter was a, a writer, programmer, and thinker who spent decades building living systems um, and online communities. Um, he's an expert in distributed computing, having written over 30 protocols and distributed software systems. Uh, he designed AMQP in 2004 and founded the Zero MQ, a free software project in 2007. Uh, for those who are in Bitcoin, you'll possibly see Zero MQ referenced. Um, he's a strong, as a strong critic of the pat patent system, Peter actually led the European effort to ban software patents from 2005 to 2007. And there's a really wonderful quote um, from Digital Revolution. Uh, the patent system has no function other than to enable gangsters dressed in suits to call themselves honest businessmen. Um, so he's a very prolific author. Uh, please take a look at some of his books. Unfortunately, Peter is no, no longer with us. Um, but his memory lives on. Okay. My abstract. <laughs> um, how do I explain this? Um, I'm going to cover a lot. And I'm going to gloss through a lot uh, in order to tell you the full story. I think it's important to see the origin and genesis of things so that we may change the system. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, I won't have time for questions, likely, uh, but I will monitor the live stream after, and feel free to reach out to me here. This is the anchor quote. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, very wise words. And I think that's something we see as a theme throughout history. Um, so, so begins the uh, review of the command and control system that uh, have lived um, for many, many years. So we're starting with fiat. Um, it's defined as a formal authorization or proposition uh, and a decree. Um, the idea, uh, typically a monarchy will use this, um, the idea is to control the levers of power, which are typically uh, the key levers of power, which are typically knowledge, resources, and time. Uh, you maintain power by forcefully subverting the will of the people and violently, uh, violently opposing alternate views. Uh, it's very important if you're a part of the system to rule by fear. It's going to get a little bit dark. Uh, so we have <laughs> on this screen um, some not the nicest people. Um, what, uh, what I wanted to point out about this is that the ends here, um, while insidious, um, or while terrible, it starts out by uh, usually painting an unjust situation uh, in an appeal to mankind's better natures, better nature. Um, so you've got <laughs> you've got here uh, Stalin. So Stalin um, led the Soviet Soviet Union for more than two years. Uh, he forced quick industrialization and collectivism in the 1930s. Um, he imprisoned millions of people in labor camps and was responsible for the great purge of the intelligentsia, uh, which he is responsible for installing in some cases. Um, again, as I mentioned, I, I'm glossing over some of this, but I will include uh, more expanded speaker's notes so you can find out more about uh, the genesis of, of these, uh, these people and how they gained power, which uh, is what I found very interesting. 
so essentially he consolidated power, so nearly all of the Central Command uh, owed their position to him. And before they could see it coming, uh, then he attacked. Uh, he uh, convicted people of being enemies of the, he convicted people as being enemies of the people and had them summarily executed. Next is uh, the leader, the first leader of the, um, the People's Republic of China and the chairman of the CCP. Uh, so Mao Zedong, as also known as Chairman Mao. Uh, he was chairman from the establishment, uh, starting in uh, the establishment of the CCP starting in 1949 until his death. Uh, any opposition to his regime was swiftly suppressed. While people support, or while people say that he uh, made some significant changes, uh, those significant changes that were forced through were responsible for the deaths of 40 million people, uh, primarily through starvation, forced labor, and executions. Oops. Not to uh, leave out the women in the group. <laughs> Uh, so Mary, uh, this is Bloody Mary, uh, Mary Tudor. She's the only child of King Henry and Catherine of Aragon. She became Queen of England in 19, or 1580, 1553 uh, and reinstalled Catholicism in a state that was Protestant. Uh, she summarily over the next few years burned hundreds of Protestant believers at the stake and for that she earned the nickname Bloody Mary. Moving on to Karl Marx. Uh, he's a German philosopher and revolutionary socialist, uh, responsible for creating the Communist Mani Manifesto and Das Kapital. He was expelled from Belgium, France, pr uh, Prussia, and finally resided in London, although they never fully accepted him uh, and uh, never... Uh, uh, sorry. They essentially denied him citizenship, but he was allowed to stay. Um, what's interesting about him is while he was in London, he founded the German Workers' Educational Society and worked as a journalist uh, for about a decade, but never earned a living wage. Now, the common theme throughout all of these is you have communism, socialism, uh, and you're starting to see that reflected in today's, uh, I struggled with the term for it, uh, woke, woke movement, if you will, and cancel culture. Um, so essentially, you're seeing a group of people that uh, feel like they've been uh, not seen by society, and um, society seems more open to hearing the, um, their concerns. Um, I do think that we get caught in the weeds quite a bit, and um, yeah, it's, it's something that, again, it starts out small. You want to make concessions for people that feel like they've been marginalized. Um, but what ends up happening is um, the extremes of that are, are very dangerous places. Um, and it, it ends up um, where dissenting opinions can be. Uh, you can be faced with a, an actual firing squad, <laughs> which is not a, not a good place to be. Um, so how does this come to be? So essentially, um, gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation where a person or group covertly sows seeds of doubt uh, in a targeted individual or group. Uh, this leads to the person questioning, uh, their memory, perception, judgment, and it evokes cognitive dissonance. Um, so this is what happens when uh, people are at the very beginning, this is one of the mechanisms. And I, I strongly encourage people to look at Peter Hingen's Psychopath Code. He explains a lot of the mechanisms involved in uh, this thinking process and, and how it's used throughout humanity to achieve some really uh, truly awful aims and means. So I want to get into the fall of Rome. <laughs> so now we've seen dictators, now we've seen uh, the command and control kind of ruling system and model. Um, what's important is to show how uh, through history we have revolutions and revolutions tend to um, beget dictators and then those dictators tend to be suppressed by the next revolution and those revolutionaries become the next dictators. And it's like a wave throughout history. 
Uh, and I'm not talking in, in terms of you know decades. These are in terms of centuries. So you'll see some, some broad themes. Uh, going back to the Roman times, there was a really strong state presence. Uh, there was philosophy. Um, we had you know, free thinking, uh, we had democracy, we had some of the greatest uh, philosophic minds, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, I'll get more into this towards the end of the presentation. But what was really interesting is that Rome as an empire uh, was considered one of the greatest military powers uh, in the world, and it fell. Uh, it fell primarily for these eight things. And I do have in the, the notes uh, links that f to the full case study. This is not, uh, not my work, but I am referenc it, referencing it because it was important to illustrate this point. Um, so essentially, um, the broad arc is that Rome became too big, oppressive. Um, it had oppressive taxation, uh, inflated the money. It was rife with corruption. Uh, that weakened the system so that eventually it became vulnerable to attack. So it's the too big to fail mentality. Um, so you can see um, all of these points. Uh, it was invaded by multiple tribes. And again, uh, I'm glossing over this vastly, but I encourage you to read the, uh, the source material and, and look at the, the actual case study. I would like to spend a little bit more time on this, but I, I am aware that I've got a, a lot of material I need to go through. Um, one thing that I'd like to point out that's a little bit polarizing on this slide is you'll see, you know, inv invasion, overreach, overspending, corruption, um, oppression, and uprising. Um, what sticks out here is Christianity. And what's interesting, and I'm going to go into this in the next section, um, Rome, uh, ancient Rome was a, a polytheistic society, whereas um, Christianity is monotheistic. And um, to say that uh, the induction of Christianity uh, was part of the destruction of the uh, regime um, is a little bit, it glosses over the point. But essentially what happened is you've got a new system uh, coming in and it's completely opposed to the existing beliefs of the people. Um, so when people are not heard in the system that they're used to growing up in, uh, then you can meet with some very violent uh, situations and, and terms, and um, it's something that's quite interesting in exploring. Um, toward the end, uh, Rome was not able to keep its soldiers, so they had to go to soldiers of fortune. Um, that, uh, they, they had wavering loyalty to the, the empire and uh, quite often were responsible for attacking the, the empire uh, directly. A new ruling class. Um. <laughs> okay, so it's important to acknowledge this beautiful passage. These words were hijacked, and I believe the message co uh, corrupted in a new institution, uh, as a new institution arose, assuming the power expressed in these words. But stay tuned. Peaceful revolutionaries have always been called out as dangerous in their time. They are to the ruling class. So moving on to the church. And broadly, if you look at the arc of power, it's gone from the state, and now it's flowed into the church. Um, I refer to the church as the keepers of wisdom. So the next, this next part uh, will be very challenging to you. Uh, if you're highly religious, uh, so I ask that you suspend your judgment and just listen. So words of freedom um, that were essentially used to enslave. Where would we be if the Dark Ages never happened, if truth and knowledge wasn't suppressed? Uh, Jesus was literally put to death for challenging power. And this is the power of the state uh, before uh, the teachings were brought into the church. Um, one of the interesting things is, as the teachings were brought into the church, it was determined by the Nicene Council. Uh, they essentially selected what teachings from the original teachings would be allowed to be included in the Bible. And you can bet that a lot of the, a lot of the messages that would have challenged their, their rule and their power were not included. So, by doing this, by determining what message could be heard, essentially censoring the message, um, 
the church could control and dictate what is true and what is known. So this is a very important point at the very top of the slide. If you questioned their authority, you were branded a heretic. Uh, by divine authority, which was unknown to the, the common people, only a privilege, privileged few could know all. And if you think back to Galileo and the, the heliocentric view of the universe, um, the fact that that was that way of thinking, which is correct, was deemed a crime uh, by the church is monstrous. So I, I wonder where we would be a society. Um, were that knowledge not suppressed? And were we maybe allowed to question and reason and um, approach the scientific method uh, versus the being enslaved by the, the religious dogma of the, the ruling class at the time? Um, what's interesting is if you uh, look at the Dark Ages and the Enlightenment, and um, again, I'm going to move on. So, moving on to the rise of the global state. And what's important to note is that as these, I guess, epochs progressed, um, it wasn't a, it, it's, it's never a straight line. Um, the existing system will be crumbling while a new system is rising. And this is something you'll see toward the end of the talk, um, which I believe we're exhibiting, uh, we're living through right now. Uh, the, the crumbling of the old systems that we've grown up with, that we were told to trust, that we have now, um, it's now been proven that, well, I think it's always been proven, uh, anytime somebody says, just trust me, you should run far, far away. So moving on to robber barons. So back in the 19th century, which was cited as America's Gilded Age, so this is the 1800 time period, uh, successful industrialists whose business practices were often considered uh, ruthless or unethical. Uh, they would have poor working conditions. Um, they were selfish and full of greed, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but when you're subjugating people, it definitely is, especially if they're suffering. Uh, it was common practice to intentionally restrict uh, the production of goods and then raise the prices. You had railroad tycoons during the 1800s. Um, being uh, given special treatment from the government, financing. Um, essentially, they extensively used lobbyists to appeal to the government. Um, broadly, the government, their, their politicians and, and their state representatives. Um, so if you look at politicians, they were essentially made men um, and indentured servants to the ruling class. And I know that's a very bold statement, but if you look at how the how the people who succeeded at the top actually succeeded. Uh, there was a lot of uh, absolute uh, abject criminality happening. And if you make the rules, um, you determine what's a crime and what's not a crime. Uh, but I think if we all look at this in the, the lens of history, we'll, we'll see that it was very, very uh, criminal. Um, so from this period, we essentially see the rise of the global elite. So previous to this time, um, we had smaller populations, um, more local government. Uh, now we're starting to see the rise of, of global, uh, the global vision, which I'll get into in the next slide. So we have the institutions today that we are told to trust, uh, that give us this wonderful uh, ordered world, uh, global economy. We've got the Bank of, Inst uh, uh, Bank of International Set Settlements, it was established in 1930, uh, 1931 in the Netherlands. It's now headquartered in Switzerland, and it's recognized by all the countries uh, in the world as the headquarters of the financial world. Uh, every central bank is a member. Next, we have the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. Um, essentially, uh, through the IMF, uh, the IMF oversees the stability of the world's monetary system, while the World's Bank, uh, World Bank's goal is to reduce, uh, reduce poverty by offering assistance to middle-income and low-income countries. But how they do this is quite predatory. Uh, they essentially loan money, uh, so they help by creating debt, and then the uh, recipient country is then beholden, uh, beholden to the IMF, um, and it's a, definitely a form of control. 
And again, I'm glossing over this. I encourage you to, if you're at all interested, look at how these organizations operate and look at the conditions uh, in which they were constructed, the societal conditions uh, where you've got the uh, people making the decisions, um, enabling uh, through lobbies, through um, through the, the rules that they determine our, our law, uh, these, uh, how these institutions were allowed to rise. Um, one common thing that you'll note is in all of these institutions, it's all about harmony, cooperation, global peace. These all sound like really great things, and they are. Um, but good principles can be used to enslave. Um, Moving on, we have the, I have the, I couldn't, <laughs> we have the United States Federal Reserve uh, representing federal banks. Um, these are the money printers. So money is now, so how money is issued? It's issued electronically as a credit. And then banks can then borrow against uh, these funds. And I think because we're all in Bitcoin, we all know that uh, there's nothing that really anchors that value other than by fiat and that is by decree. It's because we say this is the money, it is the money, and therefore it's valuable. Uh, but there's really nothing intrinsically valuable about it. And as we've seen this past year, uh, I mean, look at all the governments worldwide who have just vastly overinflated their, uh, their money supply. Um, it's quite concerning. If you're not incredibly concerned, you definitely should be. And it's definitely something you should be looking at. Um, it's difficult because it's not a system that we directly control, um, but there is Bitcoin, and I will get into that toward the end of the talk. We also have the United Nations. This was formed uh, shortly after the war, uh, 1945. Uh, it's comprised of, it's a cooperative body. Um, focused on securing peace and monitor or fostering global economic, social, and environmental goals. Again, this sounds great. It's comprised of the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the Trusteeship Council, uh, the International Court of Justice, and the UN Secretariat. And all of these bodies work together, again, to foster global harmony, peace, trade, economy. Uh, all things that sound great, and I think as, 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 a, as an organization it should exist, but we should examine its motives from time to time. And, and just make sure that the, um, the will of the people is not being subjected uh, and taken advantage of for people who can profit uh, off it. And again, profit is not an, an, an intrinsically bad thing, but when suffering is involved, um, it's... <laughs> it definitely can be. Uh, it definitely is. And I think that um, sometimes these, uh, these global institutions, the, um, the powers that be, seem too big. And how can you possibly take a stand? And I think for years, uh, you know, we've seen throughout history, we've seen anyone who spoke out against the system uh, be summarily executed, either uh, literally, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, and we have many examples of this, um, or essentially shunned by society. So beware when uh, asking questions is, um, is not allowed because the minute you can't ask why, there's a huge problem brewing. Um, I encourage you all to go to uh, W2EF, or, or what the fuck, <laughs> happened in 1971.com. Uh, this is when the, uh, so essentially this is when the U.S. currency came off the gold standard. Prior to 1971, the U.S. dollar was backed by gold. It served as the world reserve currency, as established in 1945 uh, in the Bretton Woods Accord. So, if you think about what's happened since 1971 and the divide between uh, the top 1% having most of the money uh, and the poorer classes getting poorer and poorer and poorer, the erosion of the middle class, the American dream, the North American dream, um, the you know, what we've essentially, by these institutions, told is, is what we should have as far as uh, a good life. You know, you work hard, um, which I will get into <laughs> shortly. Um, you know, if you work hard, you'll be rewarded. Uh, and it's somewhat of a lie. 
Um, it's difficult though, because at its core, at its essence, it's true. If you do work hard, if you do put in the time, uh, you will benefit and prosper. But in an unfair system, uh, the odds are very much stacked against the individual. Uh, next is we have Fang, <laughs> which is Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Um, this is the new um, global elite system, if you will. Uh, I call these, uh, these groups the information dealers, much like drug dealers, <laughs> which is a bold statement, uh, but information really is the currency of our time. And we are very much being taken advantage of. We are very much the product. Um, there's the idea that uh, the product of the, the free information system that we can, um, we can participate in, where we can share with our friends, we can connect with people from school, we can connect with colleagues, uh, we can connect with people all over the globe. Um, the connection was something that was really fostered uh, in these social networks as they were set up. And the ability to freely transact, share information across borders, um, commerce across borders, um, you know, all of these companies unlock and enable that. However, there's a darker side. Um, in the social system, and this is the talk that we, we had last night uh, talking about the social dilemma. So if anyone is interested, go back to the live stream. Uh, and we, we talked about the Netflix documentary, the, the social dilemma and kind of the darker side of social media, because there, there definitely is a darker side. Um, essentially, with social media, uh, you have information warfare. <laughs> uh, with the polarization of, of thought, you have something that's right and something that's wrong, something that's left, something that's right. Uh, and each time you interact with groups, or, or you, you take a look at, um, YouTube is a really good example. You can watch one thing, and then if you have your recommendation on, you know, the next video is good. And then by three or four, all of a sudden you're, you're, you're slowly being directed down a path that maybe you didn't choose. And I think that that's one of the things that, that is endemic to society today is we've lost the ability to have civil discourse. We've lost the ability to uh, suspend our judgment, to understand the other point of view. And this is very dangerous because Life is not black and white. Life is gray. Um, there are multiple truths. Uh, there is not one truth. And I, I think the fact that we've been sold that for centuries, um, and it's often dictated by the people at the top, the people that are in control, the people whose power is derived by what you believe. So, um, with the social media model, we essentially have the birth of the attention economy which is something to be very aware of. Okay. Um, in the, the source material, I have uh, listed a link to a uh, YouTube recording of John Lennon's Working Class Hero. I think it perfectly sums up the, what we were taught about the system versus the actual reality. So I'm gonna read a little bit and I highly encourage you, if you don't know this song, to, uh, to go listen to it. So, when they've tortured and scared you for 20 odd years, then they expect you to pick a career. When you can't really function, you're so full of fear. A working class hero is something to be. They keep you doped up with religion and sex and TV, and you think you're so clever and classless and free but you're still fucking peasants as far as I can see. A working class hero is something to be. Again, this is something I'm gonna gloss over vastly, but please take the time to go and read it. So, Ellie Dukeman uh, is, um, <laughs> um, essentially this is his Nobel speech. He was awarded the, the Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, this was, Essentially, he was the first director of the International Peace Bureau, which still exists today. Uh, originally, it was founded uh, in Geneva, uh, sorry, in Bern, and it now uh, resides in, or exists in Berlin. Um, definitely take the time to learn more about it. 
Uh, it's essentially, um, again, um, there's more information on this slide than I'm able to talk about in, in full depth, like I, I'd like to. Uh, but what was really interesting is uh, what he does in his, his Nobel lecture is shows throughout time the, the ridiculousness of wars. Um, war has, again, created nothing. It's consolidated nothing. It served merely to abase human nature and plunge nations into anarchy. And it's always the people controlling um, the wars who benefit. It's always the people who suffer. And this has been played through time and time and time and time again for centuries. So he, has a, he does a really nice job of illustrating those wars throughout history. Um, it's probably about a 15-minute read. I highly encourage that you, you take the time to go read it. Um, it just gives a nice perspective because this was uh, created uh, at the beginning of the 1900s, his talk, um, and it gives a, a nice view as to what the world was like back then before we had social media and everything was available at all time. Uh, yeah. Okay, moving on to New Rome. So at the beginning I started out uh, talking about the fall of Rome and how we started out with the, the Senate. And, like, democracy is not new. Um, if you look back at the, uh, if you look back at the uh, Athenians and all, all of the philosophers, and I'll get more into this uh, as we move forward, um, it's, it's been a reoccurring theme. It was the power of the, um, power of the state, and then it moved into the power of the church, and then it again became the power of the state. And you'll see these wide arcs throughout history. Um, it's important to, to step back and uh, not just focus on what's happening now. I think right now we're experiencing all of this, which is, which is really unfortunate. Um, we're so focused on surviving day to day, especially during this pandemic. Um, we're focused on our literal survival. Uh, previous to this, we were focused on just getting through month to month, maybe year to year, uh, focusing on your job, focusing on where you'd like to be in a few years, but really having that narrow focus. Uh, just having enough money to get by, uh, unless you were smart and invested. Uh, and um, it's something that, you know, if you, if you make a fortune, you can quickly, just as easily, lose that fortune. Uh, so being able to pick up and, and carry on uh, in a, a corrupt system <laughs> that is very much stacked against you is a very difficult thing to do. Um, so I think being able to take that, it's a luxury to be able to take that longer viewpoint and to examine history, examine the root causes, uh, which we'll get into shortly with first principle thinking. Um, for the time being, though, I'd like to give a, an interesting aside to um, America, the Great Experiment. So, between the War of Independence and the forming of the Constitution, the Founding Fathers understood it was important to check the power uh, of the ruling class, otherwise it ended up in uh, tyranny. The War of Independence was initiated by the 13 original colonies uh, against the Kingdom of Great Britain. Um, so this was essentially fought um, over their objection to Parliament's uh, overt taxation and lack of representation, in, uh, lack of colonial representation uh, in the, um, the Kingdom of Great Britain. So, Thomas Jefferson has a, a really good point that uh, when all governments, domestic and foreign, uh, shall be drawn to one central power, in this case Washington, it will render powerless the checks provided of one government on another and will become as venal and as oppressive as the government from which we separated. So what's really interesting in the, the Great American Experiment is how they recognized, because they came from a system of what they felt was unfair tyranny and, and oppression and overt taxation, uh, and they wanted to remake, uh, essentially forge their own lands and, and remake their constitution where it allowed for um, more dispersed power, more decentralized forms of government. So what's really important is within the Constitution, there's something known as the Bill of Rights. So this is a really interesting model of governance uh, because it specifically, um, it specifically limits federal power. 
So it's the first 10, uh, the Bill of Rights is the first 10 uh, amendments to the founding constitution. The constitution was created in 19, or oh, sorry, <laughs> 1787. <laughs> and the Bill of Rights was crafted uh, in 19, sorry, 1791. Uh, what it does is it protects individual rights and freedoms. And there are so many countries around the world that don't have a document as specific as this. What's very interesting about America is they recognize that uh, consolidated power, uh, if you're uh, in a system of consolidated power, it's, it's the individual essentially doesn't stand a chance. Um, so by creating this new form of government, uh, it was a, at least a first step at empowering the individual to be in a more fair state and system. Um, it's interesting to see how it's, um, I guess in the, the 250 or so years uh, that it's been in existence, how, um, how things have, have been. And if you look at America now, um, the state it's in versus the state of its founding. It's very divided and polarized. Um, one might argue that it's similar to, um, well, <laughs> I want to be really careful what I say, um, but right now it's very divided. And I think a lot of the founding principles um, are, are not there. Um, and I don't know that that's something that, there's criticism about uh, this model because um, some say that it works in a smaller society. And what's interesting is one form of government, one form of governance, uh, one form of society does not work forever. Uh, there's change. As people come into the society, society as new ideas emerge, um, things change. And if you stick to the one thing that worked uh, and you're not at all flexible to it, um, it can be eroded very quickly and uh, or you'll have something as, as awful as a revolution. Um, but uh, what's important to note is that there are some founding principles uh, that if you look at the, the Great American Experiment uh, that are quite interesting to, to see. Um, really important quote here by Reagan. So Ronald Reagan, uh, one of the state's uh, presidents in the early 1980s, uh, capitalist, freedom is never, never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the, to do the same. So what's important here is wh where, well, what's important? One thing I'd like to call out is when he says it should be fought for, that doesn't mean a violent se a siege. Um, what's interesting is that he says protected. So it's something that you must actively um, live through throughout your life and, and make sure that uh, the principles uh, these principles uh, of freedom, as you see them eroded, that you're you're on it, you're on top of it, because if you're not, they are very quickly taken away. And I think we're seeing that also right now uh, with COVID and the the horrible lockdowns and the um, the way that they were enacted. It was originally supposed to be two weeks to slow the spread, and and now we've got global economic collapse. Uh, of course, there's a second wave that's happening now. And I don't want to get too, too much into this because it's a situation that's kind of unknown. And when it comes to, when it comes to health, you can't say, well, just go back to work. I'm sure you'll be fine. Uh, because if, if you don't know the, the situation, if you don't know how deadly something is, and I don't think it is as, as deadly as it's being made out to be, but perhaps it is. And if it is, then it's something we do need to take seriously. So it's a really tough spot because What's happened is that we've been, we've allowed um, control to come back in. We're essentially prisoners in our houses during lockdowns. There are a number of countries that are going through lockdown again, uh, which is awful. Um, essentially, we've become prisoners of the state. It's for our own health, it's for our own goodwill, um, but is it? Uh, so it's a tough, it's a very, very tough situation to be in. <laughs> so, moving on to the peaceful revolution. So I've talked about the systems of, of, of command and control, and now there are some things that we can do. Again, I'm going to gloss over this because I've only got five minutes left, uh, but I think if we look back to the ancient state and the ancient philosophers, um, and we look at these four cardinal virtues. So again, this is going back to ancient, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, 
I believe in order to move forward, we need to look back. And as we can see, democracy is not new. So these principles are wisdom uh, in, in Stoicism, which is essentially the ability to use knowledge, experience, and understanding, common sense, and insight. Valor, which is known as courage. Essentially, it's a willingness to confront agony, pain, danger, uncertainty, and intimidation. You've got physical courage and you've got moral courage. So essentially, it's the ability to temporarily suffer so that you may benefit um, going forward. Justice. And justice is a difficult one because what is just versus what's just in a situation um, is subjective and <laughs> definitely not fair. Um, justice is a very, very difficult thing because in order to be impartial and just to all parties, you essentially can't be. There's got to be a, a winner and a loser, so it's almost like you've got a temporary armistice in, in decisions. Um, but it's important to weigh the, the checks and balances of the situation um, from either side to ensure that one person is not consistently benefiting over another person or another body. Um, and if they are, to perhaps make it so that it's a little bit more even without going full communism, full socialism, because that's also a danger, I believe. The next is temperance. Temperance is essentially moderation. So this is the ability uh, to withhold and to restrict um, so that you may be more in control of your natures. First principles. First principles are really important. Um, essentially, you learn to take something apart, test the assumptions, and reconstruct it. So this is going to the root cause of things, not just accepting uh, this works because it's been passed down through generations as, it's wor as it works, as it's because people have said that it works. Essentially, it's hacking, if you will. Um, it's figuring out where the breaking points are in a system and making it stronger, making it more robust. Uh, through the act of questioning, through the act of breaking something down, you make something stronger. Um, I, we see this all the time in, in Bitcoin. Um, arguments are you know, recognized and, and I think appreciated here more so than um, keeping the more so than keeping everyone happy. Uh, I think we've, we've mostly realized, at least I hope so by now, that keeping everyone happy is impossible. You can't. Uh, there are always going to be people that are subjugated, and there are also there are always be people that suffer, but I think we need to be careful about crossing over into that point where people are cruelly subjugated uh, for the benefit of others versus the people who benefit and the people who don't. It's a really big topic. I don't have time to get into it. I don't know that it could even be discussed in, you know, in a day. <laughs> Definitely not in a day. Okay, moving on. I think we all know these words. They're from Eric Hughes, uh, Cypherpunk Manifesto in 1993. I'm gonna read you something. Essentially open source, uh, is a really important principle of this movement, uh, keeping your code uh, open, available to all, uh, available to modify freely. Uh, there are a number of interesting cypherpunks. I definitely think you should look at uh, Richard Stallman and Timothy May and uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, Adam Back, uh, Nicholas Zabo, and, and many others. Uh, and essentially what they're focused on is, is writing code. Um, not necessarily solving the big world problems, but taking things on one step at a time. Knowledge has always been passed down outside the system. In a corrupt world, truth must be obscured so that it is preserved. Encrypted communication allows privacy, giving you the ability to selectively reveal a body of knowledge to whom you choose at the right time. In the meantime, travel to the underground of the subconscious mind where all knowledge exists uncorrupted. I hope we all know this. <laughs> if we don't, if people are watching this on the live stream, uh, for those watching who don't know, this is the Bitcoin Genesis block. And what's really interesting is the message you'll see 
It's the headline um, in the January 3rd, 2009 edition of the Times. Uh, the headline is the ch ch Chancellor on the Brink of Second Bailout for Banks, um, which was the, the first global economic collapse that we've seen in our lifetime. Uh, prior to that would probably be the Great Depression. Uh, some have said that the 2008 financial collapse is worse. We had uh, endemic money, money printing and um, Bitcoin was created from that, which is, well, not from that, that's glossing over quite significantly. Um, but uh, for the, in the 1990s, cypherpunks were very interested in electronic cash, electronic forms of money, uh, allowing for privacy. Um, and I think Bitcoin was, um, the way it was created, um, it wasn't advertised, there's no CEO, and it just, it just works, it just builds, uh, it's built up through, uh, through time, <laughs> enough through uh, proof of work. Um, I'm, I'm glossing over this completely, um, I apologize. Uh, I definitely think that Bitcoin is something that um, unlocks much. It's a very slippery slope to uh, being able to, it essentially unlocks first principles. Uh, if you look into Bitcoin, if you get really into it, you start questioning, you start asking why about things. And then it's not just about the money. You start asking why about other things, which I think is a really important thing. Um, there's an interesting quote here from Satoshi. And I kind of wonder, so November 2008, uh, about a month after the Bitcoin white paper was uh, released, which was October 30th, uh, 2008. Um, here's a bulletin board discussion where criticism is that you'll not find a solution to political problems in cryptography. So valid point. And Satoshi's response, uh, yes, but we can win a major battle in the arms race and gain new territory of freedom for several years. Um, he gives a, a view of Napster, um, and pure P2P networks and, and shows essentially that they remain uncorrupted. Uh, so perhaps Bitcoin does have a chance. And as, as we see, you know, about 12 years later, uh, yes, it does. And it's, uh, it's something I think that is a truly global phenomenon, very interesting. Um, we've fixed the money, which is good. But <laughs> we, we haven't won. Um, if Satoshi taught us anything, it's that the individual now stands a chance against the unrelenting wheel of power and corruption. And we do, but we can't just give up. We can't just stop and say, great, we fixed things. Um, now, we must, now we must carry on and make sure that that system stays fixed. Um, the, the system that is subverted by those that are, are now in power uh, is always looking for ways to get back in power. And if we, if we must always guard um, the, the solid value that we have in Bitcoin um, to ensure that it's not corrupted. And there are many attacks that have happened uh, throughout history. We've seen you know, the Segwit 2X attack. <laughs> I'm, I'm being told that I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go quickly through these next slides. So Bitcoin may be small and young in relative terms, but it's one giant fuck you to the command and control model. These are some sources of inf inspiration uh, that I encourage you to check out. It's essentially zine culture. We've got Citadel 21. We've got Hacker Quarterly, which has been around for a very long time. And we have 21's, 21ism, which is a, a new graphic novel uh, explaining what Bitcoin might look like in the future. Uh, these are very easy to, easy to read. Uh, what's interesting is people say that there's no Bitcoin culture, and I argue that. I disagree. Um, I think there is, and I think we're seeing that here. Um, what's interesting is it's, uh, you know, the, the creativity behind it. The next thing I'd like to leave on is the concept of the remnant. Uh, this is something that Francis Puglio recently presented um, in Plebsec. And the idea is that, uh, is the story of Job. Um, again, go to this link, go to Isaiah's Job um, by the Mises Institute. It's been reproduced. It was originally... Uh, appearing in the Atlantic, Atlantic Monthly in 1936, and essentially it's the story of um, the story of the prophet Isaiah, who's told um, to tell uh, tell people that. <laughs> Do I have two more minutes? No. Okay. So go look into this um, and and learn about the concept of the remnant. Anyway, I'm out of time. 
that's me. Find me on, on Twitter. Um, thank you. Thank you.